thanks to be here for this talk about the change data capture use case, designing an evergreen cache. I'm Nicola Frankel. I'm a developer. I've been doing Java development for 20 years. A couple of years ago, I uh, learned Kotlin and right now I'm trying to teach myself Rust. I'm also a developer advocate and I work for a company called Hazelcast. We have a product simply named Hazelcast and it has two main capabilities. The first one, it's, it, it's in mem in memory data grid and you can think about an in memory data grid as uh, a way to store your structure across several nodes so you can do replication and sharding and the other is an in-memory stream processing engine. I will be using them in the demo, but you can replace them with any technologies that you are used to uh, with the same capabilities. This is our agenda for today. So the first question I want to answer is why do we cache? Because sometimes I hear that cache is bad or you should never cache or you cache because you design your system badly. This kind of uh, questions, I first want to like, uh, let's say, answer them. Then we will see some alternatives to keep the cache in sync with the source of truth. Then I will tell you about one way which uh, seems right now to be the way and it's called change data capture and I will try to explain it a bit. Then we will see the Bizium, which is an implementation of change data capture and then we will see how Hazelcast and Bizium can work together where in cases in places where uh, the Bizium itself alone is not such a good fit and finally I will do a demo. As I mentioned, the first question I, I want to answer is why do we cache? And the answer is because of two main reasons. Sometimes you want to cache because you prefer fast data that might be stale instead of slow data that is correct. And the other reason is that Sometimes you prefer data that is, again, stale uh, versus no data at all. And in both of the cases, you can imagine microservices. So imagine you have an e-commerce application that is designed around microservices and microservices mean distributed and distributed mean network latency. And this e-commerce uh, uh, application as a, a checkout microservice, payment microservice, pricing microservice, catalog microservice, a card microservice. Well, really a good, nicely designed application around microservices. And now imagine a customer and they want to go to the checkout, so you call the pricing microservices. To, to, to know the price of the card. And at that moment, there are two, two ways that it can go wrong. Well, the network lags for any reason and it takes a long, long time. And you might know that uh, customers, they don't like waiting, so they might decide to go away, which is not great or even worse. Uh, the pricing microservice, for whatever reason, is down or the network is down or whatever, and you've got no price at all. And in that case, the business will always, always prefer to sell at a slightly wrong price than not to sell at all. And imagine that at the end of the day, sometimes you will sell a bit too high, sometimes you will sell a bit too low, but in the end, everything will be average. So on average, you will have sold at the right price. And again, you will have sold. And in e-commerce, for example, this is very, very, very important. 
So the main trade-off of caching is that on one side you accept stale data to get speed or like data. And there is nothing wrong with caching as long as you understand that it's a trade-off. As an example, I have here a very simple system. I have an application that reads and writes to a database and between the application and the database, I have a cache layer. So the cache acts as a facet. So every time I write to the cache, the cache writes to the database. And so my system is always in sync and I'm very happy. But unfortunately, this situation occurs very, very rarely. Most of the time, what will happen is that you've got a third party component that will update the database regardless of the application. And in general, those are reference tables. So you might have a registry of customers or a registry of countries or anything, and you want to have them up to date. And the problem is that if the cache has already been uh, loaded with those references, you can like update the, the, the records in the database and the cache won't reflect those changes. So the main problem is how do we keep the cache in sync with the database? And you might have come upon this quote that there are two hard things in computer science, naming things, cache and validation, and also of by one errors. And one of the way to keep the cache in sync is cache invalidation. And I need to, let's say, define some semantics. You might also have heard about cache eviction. So you have, on one side, you have cache eviction, and on the, one, on the other side, you have got cache invalidation. Those are two different things. In the end, you will remove items from the cache, but for two different reasons. Cache eviction first. So imagine uh, you have been uh, tasked to do something and you say, oh, caching is a good idea. In general, if you are a young engineer and I've been in this case, you will say, oh, I will use a hash map or depending on your language, it might be called a dictionary, an associative array or whatever. And that's a very, very bad move because whatever data structure you call it, the, the, I, I will call it a hash map because I'm a Java developer mainly and in Java it's called a hash map. It, it's unbounded, so you can put like entries in it and entries in it and entries in it and actually the memory consumption will grow because the entries, they are never removed. So the first thing you need to do is set a limit on your cache. You have a cache size. You can use any caching provider, be it Hazel Cost or anything else. They will always provide you with those capabilities because using a hash map is easy. And now designing a limit and designing all capabilities around the cache is much harder. So please, uh, like, be nice to yourself. Just use an existing cache provider that provides you with those capabilities. Anyway. Now you've set the limits and imagine you have put entries into the cache and at, at one point you will reach the limit, but still you will need to put one more item into the cache. And the question is, which item do we remove? And this is cache eviction. And cache eviction has actually multiple strategies. Uh, you can have like list frequently used, list recently used, you can have dedicated priorities, you can have plug and play strategy, whatever. This is cache eviction. You remove entries from the cache because you want to put one more entry to the cache and the cache is already full. But there is cache invalidation and cache validation is bound to the idea of time to live. So when you put an entry into the cache, you need to think about how long 
will this entry be valid until it's removed by a background threat so that the next time you ask for this entry, the cache will be empty and you will need to go to the source of truth. And that's how you keep the cache in sync. You will put entries, you will say, hey, they will uh, live there for five seconds, for 10 minutes, for two hours. I don't know, it depends a lot on the context. And after that time has elapsed, the entry is removed and then your customer, your user of the cache will go through the cache, notice there is nothing there and will go to the source of truth. And as I mentioned, it's one of the hardest problem. What's the correct time to leave? What's the correct length of the cache invalidation? And let's think about our batch issue that we have a batch that runs every hour and that uh, writes to the reference table and we want to keep the cache of the reference table in sync so it runs every hour and we have a ttl of half an hour that means that every half an hour the cache will be cleared of those items and the problem is we will go to the database, but after 30 minutes, the batch has not run. So we will actually be wasting resources going to the database and fetching the same data as was before in the cache. On the opposite side, if our TTL is two hours, that means that during a one hour window, we will be reading from the cache and actually not using the data that was refreshed by the hourly batch. So we could say, oh, let's put it just at one hour and it seems like a good idea. But again, we are thinking about distributed systems. So there is no way to actually synchronize a clock so that both the cache and the database and the batch they have the same clock and they are synchronized. Even worse, that doesn't work at all because actually the cache won't be actually be containing all the entries. What will happen is that the, the application will need to access one record of the database, will try to get it in the cache, then it won't find it, it will go to the database, it will fetch it, put it into the cache. And five minutes afterwards, we will need a new record so that it's not a bulk put into the cache that we need to do every hour. It happens like when we need it. So there is no way to have the correct time to live. And so we must guesstimate hmm, five seconds, 10 minutes. Again, it depends on your context. And it will be always hard to come up with the right uh, time to live because on one side, again, stale data, on the other side, like uh, overconsumption of resources. And now we can think, okay, so instead of having those schedule we could be even driven instead. And that fits our use case very nicely because that means that if no changes happen, then we do nothing. And as soon as we've got a series of change happening, well, we will fetch the data. And if I'm telling you about even driven and about databases, um, if you have got a bit of experience in databases, you actually think about triggers. Triggers are just the way to do that. Well, there are a couple of problems with this approach. The first one is not all uh, SQL databases um, like implement triggers, but even if one does, triggers are actually meant to do stuff 
on your own database. So inside the database, you will have a trigger that changes the data in the database. But here, we want to synchronize something that is outside the database. We want to actually call an external process. So how do, does it work? Well, I've come up uh, for this talk. I, I, I did a bit of research and I've checked the example of MySQL. MySQL implement triggers and with MySQL you can actually call external processes uh, with, with a trigger. It's, it, it's not all uh, unicorns and rainbows. Actually, you need to write a function in C++. I don't know about you, but um, C++ for me was when I was 20 years younger uh, in university and I don't really want to do that. But anyway, you will have an expert C++ developer and then there are constraints on the operating system. There are constraints on how you manage SQL. Well, it's possible, but it's not fun. And actually, and there is already an existing lib that does it for you. So uh, there is a person who uh, created a generic uh, library to do that. So you only need to come up with the, um, the query that you want, not the query, but sorry, the, um, the, the, um, the command that you want here. It's a concat something, but you, you, you don't care about what it does. And then you have this sysexec library. You just need to call your command and it will call an external process. I didn't check if it's still maintained. I, I, need, I didn't check if it, it's buggy, but at least it's, it's something that you can uh, start using and check how it works. Now, if I put on my architect hats, um, well, I, I, I have some problems with that approach. The first one is, is, is implementation dependent, meaning, hey, it's good because MySQL does it, but if you have Oracle, if you have Postgres, or worse, if you have that, like different databases uh, in your information system, it, it will be very hard to uh, come up with a solution for every one of them. Then it's fragile. I mean, you have so many moving pieces that um, it's going to be a mess. And it's not, if it breaks, it will break anyway. At that time, who will debug it? Will uh, it be the developer? Will it be the ops team? Will it be the database team? Mm, it will be hard. And organizational issues such as this, uh, we better design them before the problem happens. And it, I mean, the, 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 the chain is so wide that um, it, it will be an organizational issue designing who is the proper, uh, like, who, who is the proper team responsible for that. And if you have done trigger in the past, you know that uh, if we like trigger the trigger too often, it will be a very, very resource consuming. So it's time for me to introduce change data capture. Um, change data capture, you've got the definition here on Wikipedia, but actually I will define it um, in a way, in opposition to uh, even sourcing. You might have come upon the term even sourcing. And the idea behind even sourcing is actually that you store the events in your, in your data store. And when you need to get the state, you will replay the events one by bit. So if we start with, let's say, a bank account, bank account starts at a balance of zero, and then you have events, you have uh, credits first, I hope so, and then you've got debits, and then if you want to know the balance of your bank account, you can replay the events. And of course, the biggest benefit is that you can check the balance of your bank accounts at any point in time because 
you've got all the steps that led to this balance. This is good, but of course, with legacy system, it's not possible because you need to redesign the way you store your data in a, in a completely different way. Also, because the, the, the number of events can be very, very huge, you need to take snapshots at regular intervals so that you don't need to replay all the events from the beginning of time, but perhaps the fifth or tenth or hundredth latest events. And change data capture is exactly the opposite. With even sourcing, you create states out of events, you compute state out of events. With change data capture, you create events out of states. That's how I like to define it. And actually, you might have done already change data capture in the past. Um, if you add a database and you add uh, a job, a scheduled job, and in this database, you like run this job and based on a specific column with timestamp or version numbers or status indicators that you afterwards updated. This is already like very similar to change data capture. Triggers, I mentioned them. Triggers are also a way to do change data capture. But the current way, the easy, I wouldn't say the easiest way, but let's say right now the way that provides the most benefits is actually using lock scanners. What are lock scanners? I'm glad you asked. So you might have come upon this uh, like article by Martin Kleppmann, turning the, turning the database inside out. And in that article, he makes the case that um, if we redesigned uh, the uh, database nowadays, it would be like not very different from what we are doing right now, but actually we would like completely like decouple the symbolic uh, architecture, the symbolic engine, and the physical architecture. So it's quite similar to what we are doing, but um, when you are uh, an, a developer, and especially again in the Java world, because it's the one I'm most familiar with, when you need to interact with a SQL database, what you need is like the user, the password, and most importantly, the URL of the database. And the fact that this database um, it is as a, um, a leader follower topology, you don't care. It's just assume that it will work as it is. And then in between you have network and direction, whatever. So if the leader fails, the follower will take his place, the application will continue running. And now from the upside, it's completely different because we actually need to implement this, uh, this uh, leader follower approach. And more importantly, what we really require if is the leader fails, the follower will be in the exact same state that the leader was when it failed. And for that, most uh, SQL database uh, management system, they have a so-called lock scanners. So what happens is when the leader receives a SQL statement that will change its state, like an insert, a delete, or an update, or even a DDL, then what happens, it will write it down into a dedicated write-ahead log, an append-only log. And then afterwards, it will read this file to apply the changes. Meanwhile, the follower will do the same. And because this log scanner is unique, the leader and the follower, they will execute the statements 
in the same order because it's a right ahead log, it's an append only log. And so at the end, after some time, it's expected that they will be in the same state. So reason for this log is replication. It's also data recovery, meaning that the first thing it does, if there is no such thing as a leader follower, if, if there is a single node, we can still use uh, the log because we will write first into this file and if the process, if any process fail, then we can restart the node and it will read from the file so we don't lose anything. So now that I have explained that, perhaps there is an ID coming saying, hey, what if we hack this log? And it's, it seems a pretty good idea. Because now, again, taking the example of MySQL, this is what it looks like. And actually, we can see that here there is an update where set. So this is pretty, pretty understandable. And of course, there is some stuff that is not understandable at all. It's, it, it's very like specific to MySQL. It's not SQL itself, it's just in the implementation detail. And you might object, hey, before you told us <laughs> it's not implementation independent, uh, dependent, not independent, sorry. Uh, it's fragile, of course it is, and who will maintain and debug it? And those are very, very, very points. So what can we do? Well, there is somebody or someone or like an organization, a library that does it for us. And it's called Debezium. And Debezium actually acts as an abstraction layer upon those logs. Um, so you've got a nice and clean uh, API on top of that. Um, it's provided by Red Hat under uh, the friendly Apache V2 license, so you don't need to pay anything. And uh, like at its inception, the idea was it would be very, very um, like embedded into into the Kafka ecosystem. So uh, whatever would happen to uh, um, any database that it supports, MySQL, Postgres, whatever, then the Debezium would like capture the change and would write down some stuff into Kafka topics. And in some, sometimes we don't need Kafka. That's, I think, a problem of the industry right now. We have Agile, we have microservices, we have Kafka, and we need to use them because there are many successful organizations that use them, so if we use them, we will be successful as well. Sometimes Kafka is not the right fit, and especially for a cache. So we will have a database, we will have the cache in memory. If we put Kafka in between, it makes no, no, no sense. We would like gladly just have directly the changes from the database to the memory and without any broker. Anyway, uh, right now, at the time of this, uh, of this talk, Divisium supports already a number of connectors to uh, several databases. And of course, MySQL, Postgres, you can see those are not only SQL databases. For example, it supports Mongo, it supports um, Cassandra, or it's incubating, and yeah, there are production-ready drivers, or connectors, I should say, and there are a competing one. If you are interested, you should regularly check if uh, your um, database is supported, or, of course, you can create your own. Now, I will just, like, very, very, uh, like, fastly introduce Hazel costs, as I mentioned. We have um, two capabilities. The first is an in-memory key value store, in-memory data grid. The second is an in-memory stream processing engine. It's distributed by design. And again, it's licensed under the Apache 2 license. So 
DID is uh, you've got a couple of uh, connectors on the left. Uh, you can read from a variety of sources. If something is not there, you can create your own. There is an API to create your own. And then on the right, you can dump the data to anything that we support. Again, if there is not something that, there is, that, that fits your fancy, you can write your own. And in between, we can, you can do some transformation, combination, enrichment, whatever. And yeah, this is a data pipeline as you know it. And we support multiple languages, of course. We actually have two deployment models. Um, since Hazelcast is developed in Java, the easiest way is for Java developers. And in that case, it, it, it's used as a library. So you use Hazelcast as a library in your Java application. When you start your application, you start the Hazelcast node. The node, there is a auto discovery process, so it will find other nodes and they will form a cluster. That's great to start with. However, of course, the nodes and your application, they will run in the same GVM, so they will, comp they will compete for memory. And if you start relying on hassle costs as an infrastructure component, that's perhaps not the best way to do that. So we have another deployment model, which is the client server mode. In that case, you have a dedicated Hazelcast cluster. Again, auto discovery would provide Docker images, hand charts, whatever, or you can run it like directly with a shell command. But in general, um, like our user prefer to use some kind of containerization. And then you have uh, your application that are clients of the cluster. And in that case, the really, really good thing is you're not limited to Java. You can use any of the SDK that we provide, including Python, C++, Go, and Node.js. And I forgot C Sharp. The way to do a stream processing engine Actually, all stream processing engines are more or less those two concepts. Here I'm using um, the Hazelcast semantics, um, but if you, if you are uh, using another stream processing engine, um, it will be the same concept, just different words. The first is we declare a pipeline, and the pipeline is where we will be reading from, what steps we will apply, transformation, enrichment, whatever and we, where we will be writing to. And um, in Hazelcast, we declare it through Java code. Then when that is done, we package that code and then we send it to the stream processing engine through the client. When the stream processing engine receives code, then it gets the pipeline and it starts like executing it and then it becomes a job. And because it knows about the topology of the cluster, it can send it to the different nodes and it can orchestrate the flow. Now let's get back to our use case because now we've got all the pieces that we need. So we still have our uh, application that writes to the cache, we still have our database and we still have these components that behind our back writes to the database and then back to the problem at end. How do we keep the cache in sync with the database? What we will be doing, we will um, be uh, having a JET job and actually the JET cluster, the cluster will be a single node that will every time there is a change to the database, it will capture the change and it will write down to the cache through the cache API. Um, well, I've talked a lot. I know I believe that it's time for some coding. So here I'm in IntelliJ. I've already written the code. Otherwise, it will be a bit too long. 
And I have an application. And this application is actually a Java application. Um, I'm using Spring Boot, but it's not very important in that case. And the idea is that I've got a couple of dependencies. First, I'm using a web application. So I have all dependencies to create web application with Spring Boot. I have the Spring Boot Starter Web, the Starter Time Leaf. Uh, I will be using some jars on the front end. So I'm also using web jars because I don't want to have the dependencies in NPM. Then I will be interacting with the database. So I have the Spring Boot Starter Data GDBC. And I have here two different dependencies, two different databases. The first one is when I'm running completely uh, isolated and here I am using SQL, um, sorry, my uh, SQL uh, when I'm running deployed. Of course, I will be using Hazelcast to have some cache uh, and let's, let's run this application. So I will run the application, which is called demo application. And meanwhile, I can show you the code itself. So I have a controller and the, 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 the ID of, of this application is, uh, I, I want to uh, manage persons and persons is quite easy. Person has an ID, of course, a first name, a last name, a birth date. That's a very simple demo application. And I have a controller and this controller allows me to display all entities from the database or to update a single one. And I'm using for that, I'm using the repository and the repository does the following. So the follow, uh, uh, the, the repository uh, will use uh, the Springs GDBC template and will actually use two caches. The first cache, I will put the entities themselves. The second one will put the query. So if you know about Hibernate, this is very similar to what Hibernate does. But let me explain because I redid everything from scratch. When I want to find all the entities, I will first like define the query itself. So I will select all columns from the person table. And then I will check in the query cache if there is already a key with this exact query. And of course, at the beginning, the cache is empty. Cache is called, there is nothing. So if it doesn't find anything, what I will do, I will execute the query. So I will get all the data from the database. And for every entity that I find, I will put that in the entity cache. And afterwards, I will put the query itself with the keys so the key will be the query and the value will be the ID of each person in turn. Otherwise, if the um, statement, if the, the query has already been found into the cache, so after the second run normally, then I will get each of the keys and I will get the keys from the entity cache and I will return the collection. Now, when I want to save a person, I will just put every one of them into the entity cache directly. This is how it works. So here I'm running locally. I'm using H2, which is not very interesting because I have an in-memory cache in front of an in-memory database, but it's just to show you how it works locally. Um, here I have done a fetch automatically. So I've got all the entities. Of course, I can refresh. I will get the same results that's expected. And I can like update one row. So it will save that into the database and it will actually like reload everything and all entities will be reloaded at that point. This is how it works locally. Now, what I want to do is 
I want to deploy that in production using an other database. So for that, I have a Docker Compose file. And this Docker Compose file is composed of these applications that I have containerized. I have containerized it through JIP, but that's not very interesting. Actually, I will be uh, like providing you at the end of the talk on the last slide with uh, the GitHub repository URL, so you can do it at home. Uh, here I have the, the pipeline that will be uh, keeping the cache in sync for now. I will deactivate it because uh, I want to show you the problems that I have. Uh, here I have management centers. We have a management console. Uh, so far, everything that I've shown you is open source and free. Uh, management Center is um, actually free, but not open source. Uh, if you have, I think, no, no more than two nodes on your cluster, so I, I won't show it to you. And then, of course, now I have the database. And now what I want to do is I want to do the Docker Compose app. So I want to start the application in like this like production mode. Let's wait a bit. And now I want to stop the pipeline because I want to show you the problem first. So I will just docker compose stop pipeline. Okay, now let's see how it looks. So I'm still running on localhost 8080, but now I'm using Docker. And I have Robert Adu, Corinne Stu, and John Rowe. And so let's say that here I want to get back to Johnny. I will update it, and amazingly it works. Now I don't have any batch job that does something under the cover. I have created a dedicated application for that. So I will be using this update application. It's, it's a Spring Shell application. And actually, it's not uh, very hard. I will just be updating the database directly. So I have a couple of comments. The first comment is list. It gets me the uh, state of the database as it is now. So you can see Johnny, my latest change, Corinne, and John. Now what I will be doing, I will be updating the first row with Robert. And now if I get back to the application and I refresh, of course, I still have Johnny because this application is reading from the cache. There is no way it can work. And so we have this problem of the cache not being in sync with the database that I've talked about a long time. So the idea is now we can start the pipeline. And with the pipeline starting, docker starts, docker compose start pipeline. And meanwhile, I will show you the code of the pipeline itself. This is actually pretty straightforward. Here, it's a simple application. Um, there is no Spring Boot or whatever. It's supposed to run completely in a batch. It, well, not in a batch mode because it won't stop in a pipeline mode. So we will start it and it will run until we stop it. And it just relies on Hazelcast itself. And this is the ID. We've got a main class, uh, sorry, a main method. So the entry point, there is no framework or annotations or whatever. It's just simple, simple Java uh, um, method. And then we will create this new JET instance with a new job of the pipeline. And the pipeline itself it looks 
like it, it can be read in plain English. The pipeline is read from the database. We don't care about the timestamp now. Peak will be writing things down in the log just to like check that everything works. And then we map the results to a person and then to a map entry. And then we write to the cache. And of course, we can check what every Thing does so the database methods what it does is it just uses uh, one of the primitives of the jet of the hazel cost api and it's just configuration so the idea is that it should work in most cases so if you deploy it into a container uh, uh, in, onto a platform sorry as a container then we can replace the mysql host the mysql port the mysql it's just configuration, not very interesting. So that is pretty simple. And we write to the cache. Again, we will just be connecting to a remote cache. So we have two different Hazelcast instances running, one for the application that just managed the cache, and the other is just for the job. So the job will connect to the first one. And then again, it's just a uh, configuration and we just need to know the name of the map that we are using. Um, let's get back to the application because now uh, like the job has started. And if we just refresh now, I will be just refreshing. We can see that, hey, Robert is here. So the cache has been updated and um, so we, we caught the changes that happened before the uh, job started. That's really cool. But you might say, oh, but it takes a lot of time. Not at all. But now what, what can happen is that every time we do a change, so update to on Chiara, and if we refresh, then we've got the changes every time. So, of course, it's not supposed to be instant. We are talking about distributed systems. So there will be eventual consistency. The idea is that the window where the data is not in sync with the database is very, very small. And this brings us to the end of our talk. So recap. Uh, in this talk, I've shown you uh, the, the caching trade-off. Caching is not bad per se. It's not a smell. Uh, you shouldn't shy away from cache. You should understand that it's a trade-off between, hey, we accept stale data, but in exchange, we've got either like available data or fast data. And in some cases, it's better to have available data or fast data than correct data. But this trade-off, um, we can, let's say, manage it in a better way by using change data capture. So again, stale data is not that great, but the time when data is stale, we can reduce it to a bare minimum if we think about using even driven uh, a system and in that case, change data capture. So. Hazel cost and the BISM play nice together to provide you with this. Thanks a lot for your attention. You can read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter. As I mentioned, if you're interested in uh, the uh, repository itself, uh, everything is on GitHub under bitly.evergreen-cache.